Chapter 4 Race Week Three years before the war, a full nine years after Rhett Butler left the Low Country, on a February afternoon, Rosemary Butler stood before her pier glass, dissatisfied. She thought herself too tall, and her torso was unfashionably long. Her entirely ordinary auburn hair was parted in the center and curled in ringlets. Her features were, Rosemary believed, too strong and her mouth too generous. Her candid gray eyes, she thought, were her only good feature. Rosemary stuck her tongue out at the mirror. You are no friend, she announced. Rosemary's dress, a textured print in green polished cotton, was new for race week. Race week was the pinnacle of Charleston's social season. The rice had been harvested, dried, winnowed, hulled, sold, and shipped. The Negroes had been given their annual clothing issue and enjoyed their Christmas holiday. The planter families were in town and their mornings hummed with gossip about the rare doings of the night before and anticipations for the evening ahead. Smart new carriages and refurbished, highly polished older ones promenaded in the Great Loop down East Bay, up Meeting Street, and down East Bay again. The latest Paris fashions, as adapted by London pattern makers and sewed by Charleston's free colored seamstresses, were admired at the Jockey Club and St. Cecilia Society balls. Yankee excursionists gawked at grand townhouses, throngs of Negroes, splendid racehorses, and the most beautiful bells in the South. Cleo burst into Rosemary's bedroom, wringing her hands. Missy, there's somebody here to see you. I'll be down directly. Show the gentleman into the drawing room. He ain't. Missy, he waitin' in the yard. He, he ain't no gentleman. Cleo's lips clamped tight. She would say no more. The public room of Langston Butler's Greek Revival townhouse had carved marble mantles and varnished cherry wainscoting. A shaded piazza encircled the entire second story. The servant's staircase at the back of the house was narrow, steep, and unpainted. Up these stairs, servants carried plates and tureens for Langston Butler's political dinners. Armloads of fresh linens came up these steps. Down came dirty sheets, pillowcases, underclothing, and tablecloths. Down, carefully, came the family's chamber pots. During this season, just 15 Broughton servants attended the butlers. Uncle Solomon, Cleo, Hercules, and Sudi, and Cook had a room each above the kitchen laundry house. Lesser servants slept in cramped quarters above the stable. Usually, the yard was a beehive of washing, laundering, mucking out stables, and grooming horses. But Jiro was running in today's noon race, and everybody was at the race course. Hello, Rosemary called. The stable smelled of axle grease, neat's foot oil, and manure. Curious horses lifted their heads above their stall doors. Rosemary's visitor clutched his parcel so hard he'd indented it. Why, is it Tunis? Tunis Bonneau? Like his father, Tunis Bonneau had been a fisherman and market hunter. But these days, Tunis was a pilot for Haynes and Son. Rosemary knew the man by sight, although they had never spoken. Tunis Bonneau, didn't someone tell me you'd married? Yes, am last September. My Ruthie, she's Reverend Prescott's oldest. Tunis's wire-rimmed spectacles and solemn expression made him seem a dark edition of a Puritan schoolmaster. His clothing was spotless, pressed, and he smelled faintly of lye soap. I was asked to bring you this. Bonneau pushed his parcel at Rosemary and turned to leave. Wait, Tunis, please. There is no card. Who sent it? Untied, the parcel revealed an oversized yellow silk scarf, fringed with exquisite black knots. My goodness, what a gorgeous shawl. Yes, miss. When the virginal girl settled the silk on her shoulders, it caressed and made her feel vaguely uneasy. Tunis, who sent this to me? Miss Rosemary, I don't need trouble with Master Langston. Was it... Was it Andrew Ravenel? It weren't Andrew Ravenel gifted you. No, miss. Rosemary said determinedly, You will not leave until you tell me. 
Tunis Benot took off his glasses and rubbed the mark they'd left on his nose. He reckoned his letters weren't getting to you, so he asked me to bring you this. I seen him in Freeport. He ain't changed none. Tunis turned the glasses in his hand as if they were an unfamiliar object. I sailed as pilot on the John B. Elliott carrying rice and cotton, bringing back locomotive wheels for the Georgia Railroad. Soon as I seen him, I knowed who he was. Rhett Butler ain't changed none. Rosemary felt a catch at her throat and she gripped a stall rail to steady herself. Rhett been with them freebooters in Nicaragua, but he quit that business. But he's... Rhett's dead. Oh no, miss. Mr. Rhett ain't dead. Why, he's right lively. That man always sees the amusing side of things. But... but not a single word to me in nine years. Tunis Bonneau breathed on his glasses and wiped them with his handkerchief. Miss Rosemary, your brother did write to you. He wrote plenty.